In third video of this series, I will cover mostly assembly. Unfortunately, I have realized that there won't be enough time for tuning and testing, so those topics will be covered in the next one. But before we get into that, let me show you some examples of PET 3D printed parts. I have been mostly printing small organizer boxes for IKEA Helmer drawers, but those will be a great examples of what can you do with this filament. Example number one is box made from not cleaned cola bottle. As you can see it has brown lines all over the place which is most likely liquid trapped inside the hollow filament. At the very least I suggest using clean water to get rid of any residue fluid unless of course it was water bottle. Example number two is box printed straight after pulling. Ultimately print failed because of my error, but as you can see, surface is rough and bubbly showing how hygroscopic this filament is. Example number three is box printed with the pressure advance turned on. In marling this feature is called linear advance. Value I have used was great for printing PLA, but for PET, well, it left a hole where the seams were supposed to be. Last one is a box that was printed with a cleaned bottle and filament left in the dry box for two days. I must admit I like the result and how shiny this surface is. You don't really need to dry filament in expensive active dryers such as food dehydrator. I just put them over two nights in a transparent plastic box filled with one kilo of silica gel. There are plenty of videos how to make one yourself. And as a bonus, 3D Benchy, no surprise here. Pet does not like cooling, so most of the time I just print it without cooling at all, or with just 30% fan. So in the end, just like in the first video, I wouldn't recommend it for anything demanding or dimensionally accurate. Now it's time to show how I build my own machine, so let's get started. First of all, I would recommend some build base such as piece of wood, but anything will work as long as it's sturdy and can withstand a bit higher temperatures, for example aluminum extrusion, steel plate or perhaps even thick sheets of plastic. Next step would be to print gearbox from Thingsverse website, which I linked in the description below, as well as the video of assembly. Don't worry, it's really straightforward, so I will not show this whole process in this video. Entire instructions can be shortened to 1. Print all the parts from that page in PET G or PET. Don't use PLA. 2. Get 5mm threaded rods and cut them to about 12 cm length. Point 3. Get self-countering M5 nuts or standard nuts with a thread locker. Point 4. Buy 6 bearings with a size of 6 to 5. Those are pretty cheap and you can get them from pretty much anywhere. And the last part, you will need one NEMA 17 stepper motor. Then simply start assembling things together as there is only one way they fit. They are also described with the numbers 1, 2 and 3, so you will know on which shaft they fit into. If you have any doubt, simply watch original video or ask the questions in the comment. I will try to help. Now that you have a gearbox assembled, mount it on your base. I have additionally put some TPU stands beneath it to dampen vibration a little, but you can omit this step or just put some rubber piece. Believe me when I say this, it was an easier part of the assembly. Harder part starts now. You will have to mount heat block to the base somehow. There are some blocks like these ones that do not have any additional holes in them, so you will have two options. First would be to drill some and the second would be to just make a bigger 6 plus millimeter hole in the mounting bracket so we can use nozzle as your screw. Although I'm not sure if I would recommend that method as you may damage the thread by doing so. This step is entirely dependent on your mechanical skills. Now it's time to reveal my secret sauce I've been using in this build. 
It is this little MIG nozzle that you can buy from the wielding store. Why I think it's better than anything else you can make? Simply because it's pre-drilled to 1.6 mm and that zone is really long compared to a standard 3D printer nozzle, which gives stripes plenty of time to form nice and smooth rod. It also has a compatible M6 thread and is made from the copper alloy. Despite being 1.6, I am getting 1.75 mm filament out of it. I think it's mostly dependent on width of your plastic bottle strip, not necessarily the nozzle diameter as filaments tends to expand a little after exiting the nozzle. It will also be much more precise than a standard nozzle drilled with a hand drill. As you can see I have tested standard brass nozzle and volcano one, but results were average and I had to slow down the spooling process to not snap plastic strips. As for the cooling solution, I have used a standard E3D cooling radiator. It works surprisingly well considering it has PTFE tube inside. It also makes sure that filament that comes out of the nozzle would fit Bowden tube. Does not guarantee you will be able to print with it, but so far I had no issues. I would recommend using some sort of strip guide so that the plastic can be fit evenly to the nozzle. However, this is optional. You can get away without putting any guide before heat block. The quality of a filament can be a bit lower because of that and it will be easier to twist or snap strips if something goes wrong. And the last mechanical part is the bottle cutter, which I already mentioned in the previous video. If you decide to print one from Recreator 3D, entire process will be really straightforward. All you need to do is to print two parts labeled as bottle cutter middle new and bottle cutter top 8 mm new with pennies. Again, a link is in the description below. Then you can use any kind of rod and insert it in your base as a bottle cutting guide. Do not forget to put coins or washers between those two parts and then attach it to your base. I have used wooden screws for that purpose. While we are on the topic of a bottle cutter, I would also recommend printing bottle weight unless you have some sort of semi-heavy object with hole that can replace it. Parts are named bottle weight bottom and bottle weight top. Then you can simply print it and put some weight into it such as sand or small metal nuts. That covers up entire mechanical parts assembly. Now it's time to move on to the electrical parts. The very first thing you will need is a power supply capable of delivering at least 3 amperes at 12 volts. You can use old slash cheap ATX power supply or PSU for 3D printer. The whole circuit works between 12 and 24 volts. I have published whole project including schematic and PCB design made in KiCad, as well as the source code written for platform IO on GitHub, so you can tinker with it or just order your own board, or maybe even redesign it completely. But today I will show you a way to make it without PCB. You will need one Arduino Uno, K-pad shield, stepper motor driver like A4988, couple of resistors, capacitors and one N-channel MOSFET. In order to connect those parts I have used prototyping PCB board, but you might as well just use cables to connect all the parts. Let's start with easier components, which will be wiring up thermistor and voltage divider for temperature measurement. Minimum required to assemble are three resistors, one 4.7k ohms and two resistors of equal value, not necessarily 4k but I have used those. Then connecting it to Arduino ports A6 and A7. Capacitor is optional but if you have one connect it as shown in schematic. Let's move on to the stepper driver. Besides connecting it to the ground and power lines, all you need to do is to connect directly to microcontroller 3 pins, enable step and dir. 
Switch for MS123 is optional, but it will allow you to change micro stepping mode on the fly. If you don't have one, you will have to use wires to connect them to 5 volts while checking out how stepper motor behaves. This will be a process of trial and error getting the right combination of stepper speed in the code and micro stepping mode to make sure it's running smoothly, your plastic strips don't snap and whole gearbox does not vibrate too much. Don't worry, it won't take you long to figure this out. Last component is end channel MOSFET. There are really tons of suitable models for this use case, but I went with one of the most commonly available IRFZ34N or IRFZ44N. Minimal circuit to get this working is simply to connect MOSFET gate to a microcontroller pin while using some resistor between them. Schematic shows a bit more complex design with another transistor which makes sure that power MOSFET is driven by higher voltage and you don't end up with a situation where it's overheating. I won't get into the details why, but the short version is that power MOSFET requires certain voltage to open fully. If your gate voltage is too low, power MOSFET may not fully open which will result in lower power delivery to heater cartridge and MOSFETs overheating. PCB was designed so that almost any MOSFET can fit, as long as it can handle 3 amperes and voltage up to 24 volts. But if you connect MOSFET directly to the microcontroller, make sure to use logic level MOSFET, which has a gate threshold voltage below 5 and attach 1K resistor between gate and ground. Last step is to simply connect all those things together. If your power supply does not have 5 volts output, just use the step down converter to power up logic side. Also, if you are not confident in your soldering skills, there are some modules that may help you, such as this MOSFET module. This will be it for today's video. In the next one, I will try to cover tuning, testing and slicer settings. Hope you enjoy it and make sure to subscribe if you like the video.